book talk. And if it looks like we're all wearing the same clothes as we were in the last video, that's because we are. I only mm -hmm. own one change of clothing. Out. It's hard out here in publishing in 2024. <laughs> you know, you could watch a lot of my videos and think I don't own anything other than black hoodies, but I own multiple black <laughs> hoodies. Anyway, I'm joined once again by Misty Massey and Nicole Kurtz, and we're going to talk about how to build anthologies and what goes through editors' minds when <laughs> we decide to do anthology. And the answer should be concrete, because much of your time in building an anthology is going to be beating your head against a wall. <laughs> I, but, I was thinking, run away, run away. Run away. <laughs> <laughs> but before we get started, I want to take a minute to talk about today's sponsor. No, I don't. But I do want to tell you to like and subscribe to get notified and ring the bell and do all of the youtube -y things that I'm supposed to ask you to do so you can do the things. And my marketing director fusses at me only a little bit. So, Misty? Yes. We just did an anthology together. We did? We did. I mean, we did. <laughs> we did. Like you literally held it in your hands for the first time an hour ago. I did. Um, it was shiny. It's all pettable and soft. Look, it's so nice. It's a great matte cover. It is. And, uh, I love this cover. Lynn Hansen, our cover artist, is phenomenal. So why the hell do you want to do anthologies? <laughs> um, because I keep forgetting every time that the last one I said, never again. Um, no. Um, <laughs> anthologies... Anthologies are fun because it's a book full of little short stories, and if you're the kind of person like me that that lives on instant gratification, um, you can you can lay down in bed and read one story and be done and go to sleep and feel like you've accomplished something. So, um, so and sometimes I just want my own anthology to do that. So, this one, of course, as as I've mentioned in the past, came about because I'm vain and wanted a story of my own published, and so I just created a whole anthology to go around the idea of the story that I had. But hey, I was the editor and it, I was allowed and, and John didn't tell me no. So he really should learn to tell me no, but Hell, he generally I created a whole press to get <laughs> So Nicole, you have edited and appeared in a pile of anthologies <laughs> yes. from everyone from Falstaff to Bain Books to um, your own stuff with Mocha Memoirs Press, the press that you run. Why? <laughs> because like Misty, I forget how painful it is. <laughs> Later on, no. Um, both Slay and um, Black and Roots were anthologies created to address a gap that we saw in genre publishing. Uh, Slay in particular, there was a gap. There did not appear to be Vampire stories that feature um, Africans from the African diaspora, African Americans and Africans from the African diaspora, in a similar vein that we had with, um, you know, in the 90s. So we decided to make one. Um, and so that's kind of most of the anthologies that we do are, are because there isn't, there's a gap in stories around that particular genre. Or at that particular theme. And so that's what we do. I do it for the money. <laughs> that too. <laughs> Showcasing poor decision making on my part. Um, but I've edited, uh, I don't know, five or six at this point mm -hmm. and published a few. Mm -hmm. And I don't forget how painful <laughs> it is every single time. I remember this. It's. It is not blocked out. I don't have that safety valve for trauma response, apparently. Um, but I do let people talk me into publishing anthologies when we believe that we can convince other people to pay us for it. That's true. Because we did kickstart Nevermore and we kickstarted Lawless Lands, the last okay. anthology you and I worked on together. I was in that one too. Yes, you were. You were. You were. Um, one of the things that we're going to look for is a story that is basically ready to go, that needs as little editing as possible, mm -hmm. because we've got so much else to do that we can't be hand-holding 
people who are just kind of there and, and need more work. Um, and that may sound, that may sound mean, but it's just the way that the business goes. Um, we're going to choose the stories that right off the bat say, I'm ready to be published. They also so. need to be on theme if it's a theme anthology. And additionally, we're not new to this. So it's not like we've never read short stories before. At this right. rate, I've been doing this for 25 years. I've probably read literally three or 4,000 short stories. I know when a short story is well written. And you know point. when it's the first chapter of a planned novel. Right. right. Or a novella. So yeah, I mean, it's at, when we say we're looking and we're discarding, it's not from lack of experience. It's because we are experienced that we can, we can look at it and tell. Just like if you yeah. call out a plumber, they're going to be able to look at your project and say, okay, it needs these things. As editors and as, pub as publishers, we know when looking at work, okay, this is going to need a lot more work, or this one's ready to go, this one's on theme, this one's not on theme. So that's part of the expertise of, of building an anthology. Right. Now, when you're laying out the stories, do you all have a, do you all have a metric? Do you have a plan? Is it just kind of you sacrifice a chicken under the new moon and read its entrails to decide what story goes first. How do y'all figure that out? Because I have my methods, but my methods are going to be way more calculating, I expect. Well, I, the entrails thing is far too messy, so I don't do that. But, um, <laughs> no, usually... Your chickens are safe from misty, y'all. They are, they are. And, and if, uh, one of the things that, um, that I try to do, and this is something that actually you taught me. Um, oh, yeah, wow. you taught me something. Um, is uh, I try to grab the, the, the most exciting story, the, the one that's... that's do, 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 you know, um, that's really going to, to excite writers, readers. Um, I try to grab that story and put it first mm -hmm. because people are going to look on Amazon and they're going to do the free sample. Yep. And so if they sample it and they read something that's very exciting, um, there are really good stories in this, in this book that are slower in tone. And that's okay because they're still really good stories but that's not what I want to start out with. I want you to hit the ground running. And so I'm going to put that really exciting um, thrill pack story in first so that you read that when it, the sample and you go, hey, this is really good. I want to read more of this. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I'm manipulative like that. <laughs> well, and to jump on to that, um, one of the things you and I spoke about when we were talking about the table of contents for this was where the sample falls mm -hmm. because you always want to open strong and that usually means either one of your biggest names in the anthology goes first or something that's really well paced and has a good hook goes first but your sneaky bits your sample is 10 percent of the book mm -hmm. so if you're doing a hundred thousand word book at about the ten thousand word mark your readers are going to get cut off in mid page. So you put a really good story so that it gets cut off in the sample. And then you get the rage buys on Kindle because somebody's sitting there. Oh yeah, I'll check this out. Oh, that James Tuck story is really good. Oh, that Michelle Berger story is really good. Ooh, Gail Martin. What do you mean I'm a page in and now it's cut off because it's in the sample? <laughs> Bye. Right now. Dang it. <laughs> yeah. So if that's ever happened to you in an anthology, that was on purpose. Mm -hmm. We do that um, because that's how people buy. Nicole, what about you? When you're putting a, when you're building your table of contents, what are some of the things you look at? Well, there's a couple of things. Um, the first thing is I am, I come at anthologies a little bit different. I like stories that have an emotion that leave an emotional impact that linger. And so my first story is usually that one that is the most since I've done horror anthologies, the most unsettling in terms of emotional impact. That it sits with them, uh, with the reader, and they go, "Wow, okay, I'm gonna do another one." Right. Um, and so I do that. But I also try to make sure that stories that have similar locations or themes are not right beside each other. So there's a lot of that kind of stuff. I try to start with that emotional impact and I try to end 
also the anthology with a story that has a, a deep, hard punching emotional impact as well. I feel like when I'm talking to mm -hmm. writers, there's three spots mm -hmm. that you, there's three spots that you want as a writer. And this is just, you know, our personal pride mm -hmm. thing. You either want to open mm -hmm. or close yep. or be dead in the middle. middle. Yep. And the reason you want to be right in the middle is because somebody picks it up That's what they go to. and they go to the middle. And if you go to roughly the middle of this book, you open up to Peacock and the Purloined Monsters. Strangely enough, this is by Kat Richardson, who's a New York Times best-selling uh, urban fantasy author. Hmm. How did that happen? Wonder <laughs> if, oh yeah. <laughs> so it's just, for those of you who are of an age to have been, to have made mixtapes or mixed CDs for people, yeah. or party mixes for, um, for parties, it's the same vibe. You've got your ups, your downs, and you're managing the f emotional flow of the stories as you're going through. And you know, every author, we all go through and we look, okay, who's opening? Okay, who's closing? Well, in this one, it was kind of a no-brainer because amongst the five to 7,000 word stories, the 20,000 word novella, you stick that at the end. Yes, yes. Um, it's an it's an anchor story, not just because I'm very heavy and the boat can't move if I'm if it's tied to me, but also because it is the big chunk of text. So you don't want to put you can't put that in the middle. Yeah, you can't because you're gonna bog down and get to the end of that and be like, oh, I ran a marathon. <laughs> no, you're then not going to read the next thing. You put that at the end. Right. And then the only thing to go after is bios. And right. people will go back and scroll through bios eventually. We hope. Now, how important are covers to anthologies? Oh, my gosh. Yes. Very. I mean, covers are not just important to anthologies. They're also important to, to books in general. Oh, ooh, ooh. can I clear something up real quick? Sure. The phrase, don't judge a book by its cover, does not have a goddamn thing to do with books. Right. It has to do with people. Do not judge me because I'm a mediocre middle-aged white guy. Okay, judge me for that because I am that. But anyway, look, when you're dealing with people, you look past the wrapper to get at what's inside. When you're actually buying a book, we spend a lot of damn money on covers. Oh, yeah. It's probably one of, it's one of the biggest single budget items for every book. Judge the book. So we've built our table of contents. Yes. We've decided whether or not we're doing invited anthology or open submissions or some mixture. Right. Well then how do you sell it to people? How do you put the book in people's hands? I know how I do it, which is, I'm very large and I literally just hand it to people and they're afraid to say take no. it. And they're afraid to say no because they think I might like hit them with it. I'm not. I am <laughs> not going to brutalize customers with books. One, it limits their buying power and two, uh, they bleed on the books and then I can't sell them. That's not good. No. Well, if you're excited about um, your topic, like I love Poe. I have loved Poe since I was a little girl. And so bringing up, wanting to talk about Poe stories is just fun for me. And so when I have an anthology of Poe stories, I can grab people and say, do you like Poe? And, and as soon as, as soon as it clicks in, I can see, yep, that's a Poe reader. And I can start saying, do you need to read this book? Because there's a story based on this one and the story based on that one. And which is your favorite story? And get them talking about Poe and pretty much suck them in that way with that particular book. So, so what I do is um, I have great cover art. I always make sure that that's something that I do. Thanks, Sean. <laughs> Um, to get, you know, people are looking, and those are the covers that show up front, right? They're in a prominent area on our table. They're in a prominent area on our website. It's I mean, I book. like the covers for Slay and uh, Black, <laughs> Black and Roots and enough that awesome. I, bought the, I bought copies to sell at our table at shows you're not at. Right. So they go, and so that's one way to lure people in. And the second thing is, 
I'm actually a fan of those anthologies. So I'm excited to share, I'm a fan of vampires. Many people are vampires like vampires, but you've never seen vampires like this, or you've never seen zombies like this. And zombies, like you see in Black and Boots, Zombies are originally a Haitian thing. Like that's our yeah. thing. Absolutely. Um, and so this idea of a George Romero did not make them zombies. No. <laughs> um, and so just looking back at how uh, these different voices are take on popular cryptids um, is in and of itself a sales pitch um, because there isn't anything like it. Um, anywhere else so that that niche or that you know makes it exclusive which apparently is a big deal these days well and and the representation aspect of it, a vampire <laughs> book with a hot black woman on the cover and a sword and a sword <laughs> looks very different from most of the other vampire books on the market yes and I've watched this at shows <laughs> and watched People flock to your table because, hey, look, that's a hot vampire slayer who looks like, like me, me. Yep. and that is that has a lot of value. Yes, because look, everybody deserves to be represented in fiction, and publishers should work towards having a lot of representation because we're greedy bastards and we want everyone's <laughs> money. And <laughs> our mission statement at Wilco Memoirs is to amplify marginalized voices in science fiction, fantasy, and horror. And that's what we've been doing for the last 13 years. So those are, that's pretty much what we do. That's who we are. That's in our DNA. And so that helps with our, what that, what that's what we bring to the dramas in particular and what we do when we're pitching books. And so we don't do anthologies that don't do that. So. And that's important for any company mm -hmm. to, you know, everything you do should serve your mission statement. Absolutely. My mission statement is to feed my cats, so. And they are adorable. They are. So they deserve all the food they get. They do. That's and so you know, cute. something else about anthologies that I was just thinking about, um, anthologies remain a really good way for beginning writers who are not published yet or who maybe haven't written novel length work. Um, to to get into the market, to get their names on paper, and to be able to start building up um, a CV. So, you know, um, in in Lawless Lands, we had several writers who had never published anything before, but who sent us in really good stories. And so that was exciting for them because for the first time, they now have a publishing credit. Yeah. So, and uh, especially these days when the only um, magazine right. type uh, markets are online and so they're a lot more limited in in scope as to how many that that there are once upon a time there were a million magazines yes. you could you could submit to all the time and that's mm -hmm. just not happening anymore because paper magazines are going away right. um and so there are a few online but not nearly as many so because that market is shrinking you need to look where you can, and anthologies are still a really great place for um, unknowns to get a start. It's Absolutely. also a really great place for readers. Yep. Yeah. And, you know, for mid-list authors, it's great when we can get invited to anthologies with bigger oh, yeah. names. Oh, yes. I know you've done some anthologies for Bain mm -hmm. and get some of that, get some of that rub off being in books with people who sell a lot more books. Yes. I just I just did one for Kevin Anderson and another for Jonathan Mayberry and I've uh, been in a couple for Zombies Need Brains. Yeah. Oh same. So, yeah. Yep. Yeah, Those I did one funny. for them as well. I did one and for them too. It's any time I always tell people that I either want to be the name the singular name on the spine or I want to be on team and more. <laughs> I want to be either getting the bigger cut mm -hmm. for editing the book, mm -hmm. or I want to be the person nobody's heard of whose story is right after somebody super famous, because then I can leech readers off of them. Right. And, and people will remember, if you write a story and it, it resonates with somebody, they will remember. There's, 
I have a magazine. It's it's an old copy of fantasy and science fiction from um, I don't know a couple hundred years ago, but um, it uh, but a story that I read in it by an author that I didn't know at the time um, hit me so hard and and meant so much to me that I still have that paper copy in my in my house um, tucked away because every now and then I just want to read it again. And uh, and that author, I, I liked everything he wrote after that. He did do some novel length work after that, although I don't think he's writing anymore. But um, but there are you will find mm -hmm. um, writers that become your favorites through reading anthologies. So Absolutely. yeah, Absolutely. All right. So there's a little bit behind the curtain, a little bit about how the sausage gets made. So sorry for ruining all the myths of publishing for you. But if you like for us to ruin the illusions of publishing, be sure to like and subscribe and ring the little bell to get notified. And we'll be back sometime with more book talk. Bye. <laughs> She's a mercenary marshmallow. Yes. <laughs> Love me and pay me. I was like, pay me.